Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tufts Graduate School of Arts and Sciences Graduate Students Summer Speaker Series, or GS4. Um, today, it was my pleasure to introduce Julia Heisey and Ben Nguyen. They will give their presentation and we'll allow a few minutes at the end for questions. Julia and Ben, I will turn it over to you. Cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben. I am currently an incoming junior at Pomona College. Um, this summer, I had the fortunate opportunity of working with Julia in the um, summer research program at Tufts called the Leadership Alliance. Oh, yeah. And Julia, if you want to really quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm Julia Heisey. I'm a PhD student in Sergey Merkin's lab in the biology department. Um, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about exploring the biological role of triplex DNA structures. Cool. So to begin, I want to introduce you to a little bit about double-stranded DNA structure. When you think of DNA, something like this might come up in your mind as DNA in the shape of a twisted ladder. Within this structure is repeating subunits called nucleotide, which contains a phosphate molecule and a sugar group. And both of these groups together make up of the backbone of DNA. Another aspect of a nucleotide is the base shown in green which form hydrogen bonding with the base of another nucleotide. And this is how genetic information is coded. In normal, typical double-stranded DNA, this type of bonding is called Watson-Crick base pair. Pictorically, you can see that the yellow ribbon is represented by the phosphate and the sugar backbone that give DNA its characteristic helical shape. Whereas the colored portions in the middle is showing watson crick base pairing. You might recall that DNA has four bases, A, T, C, and G, and that A pairs with T, C pairs with G, and also that C's and T's belong to a group called pyrimidines, while A and G belong to a group called purines. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the box in blue and yellow is showing double-stranded DNA that is held together by Watson-Crick base pairing or duplex DNA. What's interesting about triple-stranded DNA is that you can have another base, box in red, that can perform hydrogen bonding to an existing duplex as seen here. And this type of interaction is called Gustine base pairing. And through this interaction, you give rise to a DNA structure with three strands in one conformation. And this is called triple-stranded DNA or triplex DNA. There are requirements to form the triplex. The first being is that the chemical, the sequence itself must be made up of a, of a specific chemical composition where one strand is homopyrimidine or full of C's and T's, while the other strand is homopyrines, full of G's and A's. The sequence itself must also be a mirror repeat, where half the sequence is repeated as exactly the same, but inverted about a center called an axis of symmetry as seen here. This mirror symmetry is important because one half of the inverted sequence actually folds back and binds to an existing duplex, giving rise to your triplex DNA structure. As you can see here, this G in the axis of symmetry is shown this tree in the triplex DNA box. And this sequence is the part that folds back to an existing duplex that gives rise to one, two, three strands in this confirmation. Another requirement is supercoiling, which essentially is the underwinding or overwinding of DNA. Imagine that you have a piece of circular DNA that is double-stranded. You then begin to cut one strand of DNA, the blue strand in this case, which then introduce a nick. And you take one end of the blue strand and rotate it um, to the green strand multiple times, and then glue the, both of the blue ends back together again. As you can imagine, it will put some tor torsional strain on the piece of DNA and introduce on what is called supercoils. And so this figure is a representation of supercoiled DNA. Imagine again, you have a piece of DNA where 
sum of the sequence is a homoperion mirror repeat, meaning it has the potential to form triplexes. Under the activity of gyrase, you introduce supercoil to this piece of DNA. It is actually through this supercoiling that drives the formation of triplexes because once the triplex is formed, you release the tension associated with supercoiling, as seen here, thus making the process favorable. So triplexes can be seen as an obstacle in DNA events, two of which are replication and transcription. Replication meaning the process of DNA making multiple copies of itself, and transcription is a process where DNA is turned into an RNA transcript, which is then processed into protein later on. So both of these processes involve an initial unwinding of DNA, as seen here. Secondly, an enzyme called polymerase, represented by the blue ball, proceeds to synthesize new bases for the new copy of DNA for replication or the single-stranded RNA transcript for transcription. You can imagine the blue ball as a car driving down a road. When the DNA machinery meets the triplex structure, it will not know what to do with it, and thus the triplex structure can be seen as a block in the road that prevents the car from moving forward. So the presence of the triplex structure in DNA can lead to a transient pausing of the replication fork. As seen in this figure, the triplex structure is, seen, is presented by the stop sign, where it prevents the DNA from being further unwind to continue on with replication. And this is called replication stalling. In regards to the process of transcription, triplexes can induce alternative gene expression or alternative gene processing which can result in shorter transcript or lesser um, RNA transcript being made altogether. And this has been shown to cause disease. Okay, so I am going to take over now and talk about a disease that is caused by triplexes. So previous ataxia is a disease caused by triplexes. It's the most common of inherited ataxias affecting one in 40,000 people in the US. The age of onset of this disease is around puberty, usually with gait ataxia and clumsiness. And this progresses to the patients being wheelchair bound by age 25, along with a variety of other neurological deficits. Other organ systems that are affected include the heart, leading to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the most common cause of death, as well as the pancreas, causing diabetes. And the mean age of death is between 30 and 40 years old. So this is a really serious illness. So Friedus ataxia is a repeat expansion disease. And in order to explain what this means, I want to back up a little bit and look at our genome as a whole. So, <clears throat> the human genome is made up of the DNA double helix that has been so nicely described, um, and it, we can break down the different types of sequences encoded in our genome. So exons make up about 1% of our genome, and this is the protein coding part of our genome. So this is the DNA that is then transcribed into an RNA transcript, which is then translated into proteins that carry out different operations in our cells. On a similar scale, we have simple repeats making up about 3% of our genome. And this is short one to six base pairs, meaning those nucleotide subunits that have been described, sequences repeated over and over again. And included in this section are the repeats that are implicated in repeat expansion diseases. So what is a repeat expansion disease? So all of us have repetitive DNA in our genomes. And for example, at one locus, a healthy individual may have a few repeats of GAA. But in a diseased individual, there can be many more GAA repeats. So instead of GAA, GAA, GAA six times, you may have it 100 times, for example. And it's 
this length increase rather than a base pair change that's actually causing a disease. So over 40 diseases are repeat expansion diseases, most of which are neurodegenerative in nature and relatively late onset, although there are some diseases that manifest earlier in life. Um, and these diseases are caused by different repeats and in different regions of our genomes and different genes. So here I have a hypothetical gene. So this gene doesn't exist in our genome, but it's just here to show where the different repeats are in their respective genes. So to break down the different areas of this gene, we have the promoter um, here, which is responsible for regulating whether or not this gene is turned on. Um, you have the five prime and three prime on translated region, which are again regulatory in nature. And you have the part of the gene that is actually transcribed into RNA, which is the exons and the introns, um, and the part that is then um, translated into protein, which is the exon. And so you can see that the repeats can be anywhere in a gene. And just to point out, Frutis ataxia, which is the abbreviation FRDA, um, is caused by GAA repeats in an intron of a gene. Another repeat expansion disease you may have heard of is Huntington's, and this is caused by CAG repeats in an exon of the Huntington gene. So as I mentioned, Friedrich's ataxia is caused by the expansion of GAA repeats in the frataxin gene. So for example, in a healthy individual at the frataxin gene, you may have between one and 44 units of this GAA repeating um, subunit. So, but in Friedrich's ataxia, you'll have between 66 and 1700. So this is a really large expansion that can happen. And so when you have the normal amount of GAA repeats, this leads to normal protein levels. And so for taxin, we'll be um, operating normally in the cell. But in Friedrich's ataxia, you'll actually have a reduced expression of this gene and therefore reduced protein. So why do we have reduced protein expression because of the expansion of repeats? So if you remember from Bin's description of the sequences that are able to form triplex DNA, GAA is homopurine in nature. So there's only Gs and As on one strand, whereas there's only Cs and Ts on the other strand. And because of this, <clears throat> and the fact that it's a mirror repeat, meaning that about this axis of symmetry, this side and this side are um, mirrors of each other, it's able to form triplex DNA. So again, here we have our two strands that are coming into this area. And then once you have the GAA repeats, you're able to form this triple stranded structure. So one, two, three strands, and then the fourth strand is out on its lonesome and is single stranded DNA. So this is depicting the GAA triplex DNA. So why does having reduced expression um, occur. So the GA triplex again can serve as an obstacle in um, transcription and can also um, induce heterochromatin formation, which basically means that the gene is turned off and it won't be producing protein. So for taxin, which is the protein that's affected by these repeats, is a protein involved in regulating mitochondrial iron transport. If you can remember, from biology, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And so it's really important to be regulating iron properly here. And if you aren't regulating iron properly, you can get iron deposits, which um, happens in cardiac muscle in this disease. You can get oxidative stress, which basically can cause damage to your protein and DNA. Um, and you can also get cell death. So the main question of the Mirkin lab which is where I'm doing my PhD, is to figure out how the repeats are actually expanding. And we use yeast as a model system. But first, I'm just going to kind of demonstrate how these repeats are expanding in humans, and then why we use yeast as a model and how we use it. So repeats can expand both from parent to offspring and throughout the lifetime of an individual. So, for example, here we have a mom and a dad and both have one allele that has the expanded repeat and another allele that doesn't. So you have two copies of every um, gene in your genome and they happen to have one that has the expanded allele. 
and they happen to pass both of these on to their child, who will then um, progress to have free ataxia in, in their lifetime. So how is this happening? How is this somatic expansion, meaning happening in the cells as <clears throat> the individual ages, how is this happening? So in the tissues that are unaffected, like the GI tract, the repeats will remain relatively stable throughout the lifetime of the individual. But in the tissues that are affected, such as the nervous system, the repeats will actually get longer throughout the lifetime of this individual. And once they surpass a certain threshold, it will cause um, detrimental effects in the cell and lead to cell death. And so my research focuses on this process that's happening during the chronological aging of these tissues. And it's really interesting because the main tissue affected in Friedrich's ataxia, as well as most repeat expansion diseases, is the nervous system. And this is largely non-dividing. Um, and so it's really interesting to, to think about how this is happening in a cell that is not dividing. So the DNA is not being replicated because the cell doesn't need to divide into two cells. And so how is the expansion process actually happening? So our DNA repair machinery can actually contribute to repeat expansion in this situation. So again, here I have our triplex DNA. And so we have our duplex, which is just normal DNA, two strands. And then we have this section that's the triplex DNA where it's the GAA repeats and we have a single stranded um, piece of DNA here. And this is really vulnerable to our DNA repair machinery. Normally, our DNA repair machinery is doing a good thing. It's correcting mutations we have in our DNA. It, it sees a mutation, it corrects it, and then we go on our way. But in this case, our DNA repair machinery can actually recognize the triplex as an error in the DNA. And that's represented by this, um, these scissors here. They can cut there, and then it leads to this break in the DNA, and that's really bad. And this needs to be fixed. And so if you can remember Ben's um, depiction of a car going along a road and kind of adding additional additional um, DNA, that's what is depicted here by this, um, this black circle. So it can add additional DNA to fix this break, but because it's a repetitive region, it can kind of get confused and add additional repeats. And that's kind of how this is happening throughout, throughout the lifetime of an individual as the tissues are aging. And so eventually um, this can lead to neuronal cell death. And so the thought is, if we can figure out which proteins are involved in this process, then we can potentially, at some point, stop this process from happening or figure out modifiers of disease in different families. Okay, so how do we use yeast as a model for this? So yeast is um, a single cell eukaryote, um, but it has a lot of homologies to humans. And so it's really helpful to figure things out in yeast first, it's a very simple system. And then we can hopefully translate this into uh, humans. So um, another aspect of yeast that's really cool is that I can induce them to stop dividing. And so what happens is I can starve the yeast of an essential nutrient such as phosphate and they enter into a state of quiescence. And quiescence just means that they stop dividing. And so the reason why I would want to do this is to mimic the non-dividing cells of the nervous system that are affected in the disease. So we want to kind of mimic this environment. So I can seed a bunch of yeast cells into phosphate-limited media, and slowly they stop, to, they stop dividing. They enter into this state of quiescence that I mentioned. Quiescent cells or non-dividing cells um, are a lot more dense than cells than yeast cells that are dividing. And so here we have quiescent cells and non-quiescent cells. And I can run this group through a gradient and the quiescent cells are a lot denser and they go towards the bottom. And so I can get rid of this top stuff and just have the quiescent cells. And I can put that in media that completely lacks phosphate. And then I can just age the cells for six days. And this is kind of um, you know, a model for when the tissues are just aging throughout the chronological lifetime of a, of a person.
Um, and I'd just like to point out that some expansion events will happen as the cells are dividing before they're in quiescence. So as they're kind of slowly um, stopping dividing. And so, so we'll have a baseline expansion um, frequency that happens here. But what I'm interested really in is what's happening between day zero and day six of this chronological aging. And so I can subtract the expansions that have already occurred at day zero from the number that have occurred at day six, and I can get um, an idea of how many expansions happen between day zero and day six. So those are the expansions that occurred in chronological aging. And so just to give you an idea, just a little snippet of what my data looks like, um, here is um, some data implicating a polymerase named polymerase delta. And that, again, is the enzyme that adds additional bases onto your DNA. Um, that this is involved in repeat expansions during quiescence. So to orient you here, we have expansion frequency, which is just a count of how many expansions there are. And we have here wild type cells, which means that all proteins are fully functioning. Um, and we have this baseline expansion frequency, but then it increases to day six. So you have between day six and day zero, all of um, this space here, these are expansions that happen during quiescence. Um, but then I can mutate a protein, so it's not working as well. And so I mutated this Paul 3 and that's a subunit of Paul delta And so there's a much higher baseline, which was um, occurring because there were expansions happening before quiescence, so during when they were slowing down dividing. Um, but that doesn't matter because I'm subtracting day zero from day six. And you can see here that there is no longer this huge increase between day zero to day six, meaning that when we are um, when we mutate this protein, it's not able to add expansions anymore. So it is functioning in the expansion process, actually adding additional repeats. Um, so this is just kind of a snippet of how my data um, can implicate a protein in this process. And I can kind of do this with a bunch of different types of proteins and figure out maybe what's recognizing the repeats, what's adding additional repeats, what's cutting the repeats. Um, and so we can do this for GA repeats or, or other repeats as well. Um, so I just want to thank you all for listening and also acknowledge my boss, Sergey Mirkin, um, as well as the other person who had a huge role in this project, Alex Neal, who's an MD-PhD now, um, as well as the MD-PhD program and um, genetics and all of you for listening. And of course, my lab who um, always supports me and is listening and Ben, of course, too. So that's it. Hey, Julia, thank you for the talk. That was awesome. Um, what do you think uh, Paul Delta is actually doing in these quiescent cells? Because most of what I know it's like Roland is in break induced replication or regular replication or basically just replication. Yeah, so it's, so it's usually involved in replication, obviously, but there are some replication proteins that are still there in quiescence. Um, and so I think it's kind of just doing gap fill-in, um, which it's able to do as well. So if kind of, you know, something is nicking um, so, I mean, the other thing that I didn't really mention is that actually the largest thing that's happening is deletions, which is basically you're not just um, cutting the DNA, but you're like getting rid of a whole area. And so they're deleting like the area around the repeats too. So that's the largest thing that happens. But then in expansions, we're thinking that maybe something is just nicking and not doing a double strand break. And then it's kind of filling in the gap. And then you would also need error prone repair to make the other strand longer as well. So that's what we think is happening, but we haven't found the nucleus that cuts yet. And we've tried like everything we can think of so far. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, where we're at. Thank you. I think Robert Cook was maybe raising his hand earlier. Yeah. I, uh, I apologize. I missed the, the first part of the talk. So you may have explained all this, uh, but I am curious since uh, I am a psychologist. So the part where I was able to finally jump in, uh, you were talking about intestinal and nervous system cells and how they differ with regards to the effects of repeats. And why do nervous system, why do nerve cells accumulate repeats over their replication that intestinal cells don't? I walked in right on that part. So I may have, you may have said why that is. 
So that's a major question um, and why we're kind of trying to look at the difference between what's happening in dividing and non-dividing cells. There isn't really an answer for that. We think maybe it's kind of a different, like different proteins are being expressed in cells that are not dividing versus dividing more rapidly. Um, mm -hmm. That's one hypothesis. Um, but that is kind of like a main overarching question. But basically people have, you know, looked at different tissues and seen that expansions are accumulating like very like huge expansions and um, more frequent expansions are occurring in the nervous system. And that's also true in Huntington's. And that's like a common theme in repeat expansion diseases in general versus the unaffected tissues. And so that's kind of a, another main facet of what kind of is a major question of why this is happening. Yeah. yeah. And so is that related to age? Yes, it is. It's directly correlated with age. And so they see that in mice as well, um, when they're able to sacrifice um, mice throughout their lifetime. What's actually interesting, especially in Huntington's, I'm remembering this data specifically in the striatum, is that at first they didn't think that this is what was happening because they weren't able to see the long expansions because the cells had already died. And so when, you know, when they, after, um, after patients had died and they looked at their brains, they weren't actually able to find the cells that had really long expansions. But then in, in people that didn't have um, symptoms yet who had passed away, um, they were able to see the large expansions in the striatum of those individuals with Huntington's. And so then in mouse models, they were able to see that when they sacrifice mice throughout time, they're able to see it get longer and longer. Well, very interesting. Thanks for your question. And do we have any other questions? You should be able to unmute yourselves now. Um, all right. Well, Ben and Julia, thank you so much for your presentation and thank you everybody. Um, for attending. So we will put this presentation on YouTube and distribute the link for us to revisit. And if you have any other questions, feel free to direct them to Ben and Julia, or you can send them to our office and we will direct you. So thank you again, Julia and Ben, and everybody um, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for Thank you.